like there might be a little more oil in the center of the lane than there was during the qualifying and the match play. And I think the spare situation could be very interesting. Mm. Well, she can cut the lead to 36 with a strike here. That's a better shot by Polly Hale. She still looked like she was a little tentative. The ball came off her thumb a little bit slow. She wasn't able to get the ball to flip into the pocket quite as well. Good follow through, but the ball just doesn't quite drive. And you see the four pin laying in the channel next to the seven. I think it adds to the intrigue. So many of these bowlers have never bowled on television before. Uh, there are only two on this on, in this match that haven't, but uh, most of them don't have a lot of television mm -hmm. experience. One of the interesting things about the format, especially for the women, is the fact that they qualified yesterday in a different bowling center. And then they came over early this morning, got a little extra practice, and then started match play here. So they had a change of condition to a certain extent also. Janine Ditch had a strike her first time up. Rolling here in the seventh and leaves the 10 pit. Not a bad shot at all. She struck her first time on television. This looks like a pretty good shot, but the ball just, the six just won't take the 10. That looked like she just never went through it. First open for Frameworks. You see high game put in by uh, Embroidery. Barry Asher Embroidery with a 10.99. And of course, Reb's Pretty Girls International right up there with them. Susan Conda from Oceanside rolled a 2.78 this weekend. And Christy Witcher and then Stacy Ryder. Mm-hmm. Dottie Nadu. She had to strike her first time up. Good shot again, a little wide. And you see the high series put in by Sharon Aronson from Costa Mesa. Wonderful 726, Marilyn Frazier right behind. Stacy Ryder had a 217 average. Uh, Virginia, you were a part of this tournament. You guys started off hot, your team, but uh, we what happened? Well, another <laughs> situation of you have to make spares, you have to mm -hmm. make good shots, and if the team gets down, you don't go anywhere. Ooh, ooh, ooh. almost chopped it. <laughs> sort of a relieved smile. Her team is rather relieved, especially mm -hmm. in the situation that they're in right now. Yeah, they're making a comeback down by 35 right now. Laura got a little soft with that shot. The speed allowed the ball to hook through the nose. Four, six, seven. She'll probably go for two and try and salvage pin count. But there again, now you see they started off really strong, mm -hmm. all that positive vibes and everything, and now you don't see that, that same type of enthusiasm. That's all part of the Baker challenge, though, isn't it? I mean, you, as an individual, you start off with four strikes, you really feel like you've got it cooking. But in the Baker format, when you only bowl two frames, it's very tough to keep that consistency through the whole game. Absolutely. Neil Grijalva. Nice follow through, a little, a little tight. You got she a little went, fortunate there. Well, she went through the nose the first time. Mm -hmm. And that time, she was fortunate to break down the split. Fairly easy spare, the 6'10". I will say this, this spare was chopped a lot this weekend. Any particular reason for that? Uh, the way the back ends were hooking. Of course, you pick up a different ball that goes straighter, and you saw she almost mm -hmm. chopped that one. But if you pick up a different ball that goes much, much straighter, it cuts down the possibility of that. And there's the WIBC director, Pearl Keller, who has done such a terrific job mm. this weekend. And Elaine Hagen, first vice president. Those two ladies worked very, very hard during the weekend on this tournament. Elaine, also president of USA Bowling. Glad to have her on hand. She'll help us with our trophy presentation. Oh, solid nice shot, shot by, oh yeah. Sharn needed that too, because she wanted to set up the, the 10th frame 
for Cindy. Great shot. Watch the ball drive the pocket. No 10 pin there. You know, the unfortunate thing for Frameworks, they were certainly on pace after starting off with four strikes for that $500 bonus, but no chance now. A high Roller Tournament Series. Well, and here you have an anchor bowler mm -hmm. that's doing exactly what you want her to do. She's thrown her strike in the fifth frame, which resulted in a double for Team Storm. Now she throws a strike in the tenth. If she gets a double, she can really move them back within range of winning this match. Mm -hmm. A possible 186 for Team Storm if she strikes out. Tomorrow, that one just a little bit high. A little bit high, and, and she knows what she did. She kind of got around it a little, got the thumb out late. But Kelly has enough speed to be able to even do that and have the ball hold pocket. A lot of other people with less speed might hook through the nose and leave a split. So it will be a 175 beginning for Team Storm. As Kelly misses the four pin. Well, when you saw the look on her face, she didn't expect that ball to hook past it the way it did. Now, if, if Cindy Coburn Carroll can strike out, she's going to take a 50-pin lead for her team. Mm -hmm, a 225 possible for Brunswick Frameworks. Good shot. There's one. And that gives them a double. And you see how strong these two anchor bowlers are. Both of them touring players and a lot of experience. Great shot, good follow through. The ball drives the pocket. Cindy Coburn she Carroll. That one. Yep, she sure did. And leaves the 310, but uh, if you're ever going to have a split, that's the time to leave it. It certainly is, and they're still going to have almost a 40-pin lead. Here again, you see she changes to her spare ball to shoot cross lane so that the ball doesn't hook. And it didn't hook quite enough, but it only cost them one pin at this point. But a 37-pin lead heading into game two of this first match of the Brown